Hi there. This is Tim again. Um, so today, um, or for this episode, I'm going to talk about um, um, basically uh, a mistake my statistics teacher made. Um, he was explaining a valid concept, and I believe his understanding of the concept was correct. Um, however, the statements that he was claiming to be true and false were in fact not correct. So if you look here, this is actually one of the slides that he presented and I took a quick snapshot with a photo and you can read um, the question asks which of the following statements is correct. And the first statement is the unknown parameter mu has 95% chance to fall into the confidence interval. And then the second statement says the confidence interval has 95% chance to cover the unknown parameter mu. Now you might be thinking oh these two kind of sentences mean the same thing basically they're just kind of backwards from each other and uh, you would definitely be correct by saying that. In fact, those two statements are semantically identical. So if one of them was true, then the other one would also have to be true. And if one of them was false, then the other one would also have to be false. But he said that one of them was actually true and the other one was false. Um, he said this to make a point, um, which was, like I said, a valid point, but I believe that the, the inferencing from the semantics of these statements was actually done incorrectly. So this says the unknown parameter mu has a 95% chance of falling into the confidence interval. So there's two essentially uh, two assen two variables here. We have mu and we have a confidence interval, and we also have two variables in the second statement: confidence interval and a parameter mu. And both variables are treated ambiguous, ambiguous, ambiguously. Ambi they're treated. Um, in such a way that one of them is not preferred above the other in context. So um, basically what I'm saying is just because one variable appears before another variable in a sentence does not imply which variable comes first in context. So um, actually it's ambiguous which variable from just given this sentence alone or this statement alone which variable is implied to have a greater context than the other variable and that's really what his argument was about his argument was was actually about uh, the fact that the context of the confidence interval was actually bounded within the context of the unknown parameter mu which meant that if you were going to take multiple observations, as seen in statement three, which I'm glad that there's kind of more examples here, um, basically, um, the con there would be different confidence intervals, but mu would be the same for all of those. Um, and it would not be true the other way around. You cannot have uh, multiple mu's uh, for one given confidence interval is basically the idea. It's um, <clears throat> so essentially the 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 main point was something that should not be shown with those sentences because those sentences are um, are essentially equivalent. They're just English in uh, in versions of each other. So another way we can write them is more graphically. We can just say that a mu, sorry, I'm gonna write it like this. Um, 
I always get my 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 uh, epsilons backwards, but I'm not writing an epsilon. I'm writing a mu. So anyway, you can you can probably say something like mu is I don't know. Let's just make up a terminology. Let's say mu is within the interval, the confidence interval, or something like that. Uh, such that this notation right here means that the confidence interval has um, two, uh, let's say the confidence interval is an alpha and a beta um, interval, and this implies that alpha is less than mu, uh, or we'll, let's just say it's less than or equal to, because it might be less than or equal to, but we'll just say it means less than or equal to beta. So essentially what I'm also doing is um, by changing statement 1 to statement 2, I'm essentially literally just doing something that's as simple as uh, reversing the notation. So I'm basically defining something that would essentially look like this. So it's, it's the exact same statement, um, it's just syntactically reversed. There's literally no semantic difference whatsoever. The only difference is the syntactical presentation. So this statement right here, we will say it means the exact same thing as this statement right here. Um, it's kind of like saying um, the dog is in the dog house right? That means the exact same thing as the doghouse is, um, I guess, encapsulating the dog. Of course, we're going to assume that in and encapsulating are precisely inversions of each other. Um, but th that's essentially um, my argument is right here, and those statements being equivalent is that they actually state the exact same thing, but they're syntactically different. Now, what was it that my teacher was actually trying to say, and how should he go about presenting it? Because why should I try to correct him unless I have a good idea for a solution? Well... Here's kind of it, the solution um, that I would do, and this is some the reason why I understand this uh, topic um, is because this is essentially related to my research, and it has to do with something called context and free variables and bound variables, and it applies to not just computer science and type theory, but pretty much all mathematics in general and proofs and any kind of symbolic or algebraically based, any any kind of math that uses variables in general kind of follows these rules um, all the time. So we're gonna say mu, and then I'm going to add like a special kind of notation, and it's just a bracket. It's kind of like a bracket you'd see in programming where you define like a class or something like that. And so what this means is mu is gonna make sense to talk about this specific mu as long as I talk about it within these brackets. Okay, and then within these brackets, I'm gonna say, oh, well, I want a confidence interval, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually denote it with one. So this is confidence interval one. Okay, so and then I'm gonna end the brackets here. So now whenever I talk about mu, I have to talk about it within here, if I'm talking about it out of here, then it's actually would have to refer to a different mu. Specifically, this mu only makes sense in these brackets. And then confidence interval one makes sense in these brackets to talk about. Now, if I say something about like, well, confidence interval one is inside of mu, well, then this, this kind of makes sense. We know that this mu is this mu. 
And we can actually say uh, there's another mu down here that we're going to talk about. In fact, we're not even calling this mu2. Uh, we could call it mu2. Why not? I don't know. Mu2. It's like a Pokemon name. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter. We could just call it mu. And uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't really matter because we defined its brackets. We defined its context. So if we talk about mu in here and we say mu equals 10, well, it doesn't mean that this mu is 10. It just means that this mu is 10. Um, and we're going to erase that too so that you're not confused. So there's actually two mu's that I'm talking about here. And the reason why I can do that is because I'm... I denoted a notation that said uh, explicitly where this variable can exist, which we don't usually do in math, but I'm going to do it here because it helps uh, make explicit uh, the problem that we're actually trying to explain. So within this mu, we can actually talk about more confidence intervals. In fact, we can talk about thousands of them. So I can say confidence interval 2 and start a bracket and then end a bracket. And then when I say um, confidence interval 2 is, um, is, is covering mu, then, or, or is, let's say this notation might mean it has a 95% chance of covering mu, um, given just, I don't know, it's, or, well, maybe not just given that information, but let's say it's a statement that it is. Um, <clears throat> now we have these two statements. Now, it would be completely illogical to say that, well, <clears throat> let's say mu can be somewhere between, I don't know, 0 and 10, and we have a confidence interval between 0 and 4, and then another confidence interval between 6 and 10, and we say, well, there's a 95% chance that mu is in this confidence interval, and then there's also a 95% chance that mu is in this confidence interval, but mu can't be in both intervals. In fact, it can only be in at most one, so maybe mu is there. So we can't actually say this anymore. Um, we can't put a log we can't put a formal logical end because that wouldn't be making the most of our information. In fact, just given one confidence interval, maybe this could be true. Um, but once we have two of these and we know that they don't overlap, then that really isn't true anymore. And I think that's kind of the point my teacher was getting at. He was saying that, you know, mu is not something that changes. It's something that's static and it's fixed. In fact, he specifically used the word fixed. And I believe that fixed kind of refers to this. It's an outer more, it's a more outer context than another variable in which we are talking about. That's really what fixed means. And in this case, um, we have another fixed mu and a different kind of sister problem, I would, I would say. And um, we could talk about confidence intervals with this mu. And what's interesting is we have two confidence interval ones, but they're different confidence interval ones because they're in different problems. But it would kind of be silly to say that, oh, well, well, I, I guess, um, well, the, the, the mu, you know, might, might fall within this confidence interval, um, but then again, it might fall within the other one, and who knows, it, I guess it has a 95% chance of falling with, within both of these, but that doesn't make sense because there's only one there's only one mu. If we put a mu inside of the confidence interval, um, that would be a different story. So if we if we had a different type of situation where we had some kind of confidence interval and we were saying, well, ninety five percent of my dice rolls are, are gonna fall within this interval, then we wouldn't really call that fixed anymore. And we probably shouldn't really call it a confidence interval, but I'm just using the same terminology to show the difference. Um, and so in this case, you'd have, you know, mu1 and maybe mu2 or something like that. And you could show how different ones could fall within it and different ones, other ones would not. And if you 
kept trying more and more of these mu's, 95% of them would fall within this um, confidence interval. So I think my teacher was explicitly saying this is not how the problem works, but in fact this is how the problem works. So I would say this is a better way to explain it. Um, and if we want to explain it in words, well, let's go ahead and do that because that way I would be completing my advice for my teacher and how to actually go about doing this. So let's correct this and give them a way to actually give us sentences um, that make sense. So instead of saying the unknown parameter mu has a 95% chance to fall into the confidence interval, because he used the for both in both sentences, we can actually say this. Um, given an unknown parameter mu um, <clears throat> the confidence interval has a 95% chance of covering mu Okay, that would be a correct statement because we're given mu first, so it's the outer context. Another correct statement could actually reverse it. So the con uh, mu, uh, let's hold on, hold on a second. Um, the confidence, how do I say this? Uh, we could say the given uh, unknown parameter mu see the key word is given because that means that it's an outer more context so the given unknown parameter mu has a 95% chance of falling into the confidence interval that is actually correct because it is the same semantics as the first sentence. It is just syntactically reversed. And it's treating mu as the outer context, just like this one is. Now, here's some incorrect ones um, for my teacher to use if he so decides to take my advice and, and uh, actually see this criticism through. Because um, I am, I guess, a pretty critical person and it might be difficult to to watch this or something uh, I don't know but um, I, I enjoy these types of topics because I believe that um, there's a formal way to do things so um, so the the wrong way I guess that he was looking really looking for was uh, let's see so given the confidence interval I'm going to say a mu has a 95% chance of falling into it So that, I don't, I don't know if I'd say this is actually incorrect yet, but um, it kind of begins to not really um, attribute, it t doesn't really ap apply to our problems, I guess, would, would be the right way to say it, because um, you can't really have more than one mu, so... Um, I don't know if this would be an incorrect statement right here. Maybe given, let's see, given the confidence interval, a mu, mu, a mu has a 95% chance of falling into it. 
Um, hmm. That could be true if you're just given one confidence interval, actually. Um, let's see here. How do we word this in a way that would actually have to be incorrect? Because I know that this, this right... This right here would have to be incorrect, because once you're given two confidence intervals, uh, then it's obvious that you can make an incorrect statement um, by saying, well, given two confidence intervals, uh, such that they are disjoint, um, there is a 95% chance uh, that mu will fall into the first and there is also a 95% chance that the mu will fall into the second. That is uh, an example of a false statement uh, because there is only one mu. So um, given, given a confidence interval a mu has a 95% chance of falling into it. Um, given uh, multiple given uh, multiple confidence intervals uh, given multiple confidence intervals such that um, each has 95% chance of <clears throat> covering mu um, within their own, within given their only that confidence interval. It is not true. Um, that it is not necessarily true because I suppose they could all be the same uh, confidence interval or something silly like that but it's not necessarily true that mu has 95% chance of falling into confidence interval I um, where I guess I would be one of the confidence intervals. So um, that was kind of an interesting topic. Um, I like seeing math kind of formalized a little more. Um, I do kind of want, you know, feedback and arguments and comments about this. It's not meant to just be a one-sided kind of topic. So if there's, I'm sure there's actually even uh, better ways to kind of explain or present this idea, but I do know that it, um, it basically relates to context, and I do have an understanding of um, like formal grammars and and uh, variables and things like that. So if you're knowledgeable about the subject, and you can make an intelligent comment or argument, I'm completely open to that. Um, like I said, if you understand the statements going on and you understand the arguments and what is being said and on, on both sides and you can help improve on how s these things can be taught or how these things can be explained um, that is a very welcome um, viewpoint um, but if you're having trouble understanding kind of what these are maybe um, maybe just kind of pose a question or something but don't jump to conclusions as to whether someone's you know, right or wrong or about something for sure. Um, 
like I said, I thought about this and this isn't just something that I do all the time, just kind of randomly or sporadically. It's only when I'm sure about something. And I know my teacher wasn't, was not very um, confidently just um, talking about those two specific statements the entire lecture. He was actually t rambling on about um, the iterations and taking multiple confidence intervals per um, per mu and things like that. So I'm pretty sure he wasn't exactly focused on the statements themselves syntactically. Um, it was pretty clear that he was focused on basically his main idea, his main point he was trying to get across. And um, I'm not sure if every student in the class understood what was going on. I'm sure many of them did. Um, but I'm not sure any of them actually caught that as a mistake. But I believe it should be considered a mistake because um, it's important to make sure things are said clearly and, and make sure that um, the meaning of statements doesn't need to be supplied by like, for example, statement three that he gave. Um, uh, that should not, um, in theory, that should not actually be a necessary thing. You shouldn't need multiple examples to try to come across explaining an idea. You should be able to write it down syntactically in a way that is able to be parsed and actually come across giving all information correctly. And that's, that's a good way to communicate. Um, it might be difficult, it might be tricky, we might have to do, you know, things to kind of ch change how language works and things like that in order to get there. But um, ultimately, that that is what will work better. And it kind of sounds maybe restrictive or mean or something like that to some people, but that really is, um, that really is how languages work. I mean, they have underlying mathematics to them. They have underlining lining grammars and some of those grammars might need to be expanded to include more explicit um, talk about context and maybe in computer science uh, explicit um, um, reference to not just context but um, parameters and, and, and functions and types and things like that that are more even more complex so um, yeah, the, this was kind of a, an interesting subject, probably some people, some, some of you might be wondering why I'm picking on something that might seem so insignificant or small, but, um, if you haven't really looked into type theory and, um, some things, um, that I've been talking about for a while, it might it might actually come across that way. It might seem like it's just something that's insignificant. Um, but ultimately, these things kind of do add up. And there are definitely like good solutions to things that people don't really see. And I'm just trying to bring that to light kind of one step at a time here. So uh, let me know what you guys think. I'm really curious to kind of start discussions on this kind of topic um, and I really want to help even formalize or maybe help even just change how some mathematics are done and I think there's another video that I'm actually going to do on uh, something related directly to this where I got in a deb uh, debate with one of the TAs for this class um, who's under the same teacher actually with a different, it was a different subject, a different argument, but um, I think I can explain like kind of both sides of the argument and then kind of the semantic, the underlying syntactical kind of uh, issues at hand and why it mattered to me and it probably didn't really matter to the TA and he kind of thought it didn't really matter. Um, and I'll get back to you guys in another video. I'll see you later.